Okay, thanks. I'm Harlan Crow, and welcome everybody to Old Parkland uh, for this debate, the first important debate we've had this year, and I'm really happy that you came to the trouble to come out. Um, I uh, have a few comments, and we'll try to move quickly. Uh, Matt Toyer was here in Dallas. From Matt is a leader with the Manhattan Institute, based, guess, in Manhattan, and uh, uh, was here several months ago, and we discussed tonight. And at that time, it was just an idea, but Matt uh, decided that it was an idea they wanted to back and make happen, and so here we are. So Matt, thanks to you, and thanks to the Manhattan Institute for your all the great things you've done to make it possible for this night to occur. Uh, uh, Jared Bernstein is here as one of our debaters, and I know that he is good. <laughs> the reason I know this is because Charles Murray and I are longtime dear friends. And when Charles heard that Gerald was the opponent, he's, I, I won't quote him exactly, but it was off shucks or something, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. It wasn't exactly off shucks, but it was like that because he said that Jared would be a formidable and able opponent. Uh, Charles and I have been friends for such a long time. We've traveled the world together. We've watched our kids grow up together, and we're dear friends. So I think it's okay in the context of that friendship for me to say to you, it's okay to protest. <laughs> have at it. <laughs> Dave Trent is a Dallas businessman. Dave served in the military. He studied uh, business at the SMU Business School, and now he's a leader with Westmont Realty here in Dallas. In addition to those facts about Dave, he went to SMU and convinced them that they should start a, a, a chapter of the Adam Smith Society. Adam Smith and Manhattan are working together to promote on campuses around the country uh, this uh, important effort. So I'm going to let Dave uh, introduce the rest of the evening, and I'm done. <laughs> Thank you again, Mr. Crow, for the introduction, and good evening, everyone. I, everyone in here has probably heard that to speak in front of a group of people, you need to be three things, brief, brilliant, and gone, right? <laughs> well, I can be brief and gone. Brilliance is right here. But two out of three isn't bad. So before we go any further, on behalf of all the members of the Adam Smith Society across the nation, especially at SMU and the Dallas Professional Chapters, we wanted to extend our sincerest gratitude to everyone who made tonight's event possible. So to Allison and Jane of the Adam Smith Society, you've worked tirelessly to make this event and so many other events possible. We thank you for that. To Marilyn Fidak, the godmother, as we like to call her, her continued selfless dedication to the mission of this organization keeps it going. We thank you. To our moderator, Jared, Drs. Murray and Bernstein, Thank you for bringing your expertise and for making the trip to Dallas to make this debate possible. And lastly, most importantly tonight, to Mr. Crow and to everyone at Old Parkland for your hospitality and graciousness in allowing us to have this debate at your location, that there's not a better place in the city of Dallas for this inaugural event. Thank you. So for those in the room who may not be too familiar with the society itself, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on uh, the organization and how we brought it to Dallas. So in short, the Adam Smith Society is a nationwide chapter-based association of free market-minded MBA students and business professionals. We promote debate on any topic that has to do with the most important issues, economic issues of our day. A project of the Manhattan Institute the society convenes in cities all over the country with over 7,000 people for debates just like these. 
the society itself was founded in 2011. I was fortunate enough to be involved in 2015 when we brought it to the SMU Cox School of Business at, uh, here in Dallas. Um, the director of the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom at the time, Dr. Bob Lawson, uh, approached me and Brent Schiffer about bringing a chapter to our campus. And uh, given mine and Brent's passion for the mission of the society, uh, Bob, or Dr. Lawson, excuse me, soon realized how little guidance you had to give to military off officers to, uh, to get fast, effective results. We, we knew it was paramount to bring it to, to Dallas and, and SMU, but and despite Mr. Crow's kind words, under Brent's leadership, we, uh, we were able to take this organization from concept to charter in less than three months. That was no chapter in the society had done it that fast at that time. Uh, Brent and I also like to remind Dr. Lawson every chance that we get that uh, the two gentlemen whom he entrusted to form this chapter also then diligently earned the respectable grade of, wait for it, B plus <laughs> in his microeconomics class. Um, but there is a lesson to be learned there and uh, although I and I don't know about Brent, can't really remember the shape of the Laffer curve, I do know that if you take to an Army and a Navy officer, ask them to screw in a light bulb, they can do it if they, if they think about it long enough. <laughs> Probably not the Navy guy. But, um, all right, so I already spoke to the purpose of the organization, but uh, to unpack that a little bit more, our organization recognizes the incredible importance of debate and reasonable discourse in educating the future business leaders and decision makers of the United States. We welcome discussion on any economic topic and we hope to represent all sides of that debate. That, my friends, is where we discover true enlightenment on those issues that will decide the fate of this nation. This organization exists to provide that opportunity for that enlightenment, and that's why we're here tonight. In beginning this professional chapter in Dallas, debates like these are the heartbeat of our organization. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's debate, Mr. Jared Lenson. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And uh, I want to start by thanking the uh, Adam Smith Society for organizing this event and uh, bringing me down to Dallas, uh, as well as Mr. Crow for hosting me in this gorgeous venue. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jared Lindzen. Uh, I'm a journalist from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I believe they brought me all the way down here because they needed somebody to act as a peacekeeper between these two, <laughs> uh, which is uh, something we are known for up there. Um, I'll try not to apologize too much, but uh, <laughs> I'll probably call it a tie. Um, <laughs> Actually, no, I, um, I am in Dallas, I'm in America, I'm going to play by your rules, which uh, if I learned anything from the debates I watched last year on TV, uh, the winner is whoever comes up with the best nickname for the opponent. Um, now, uh, Dr. Murray, I'm going to have to ask you to be careful because we share a first name, Dr. Bernstein and I, so please use his last name when coming up with your <laughs> nicknames. Um, all jokes aside, uh, my career as a journalist has brought me to some very interesting uh, events in some very interesting venues with some very interesting people. Today it's this event with you people. Um, back in February, an event I attended in uh, Dubai called the World Government Summit sought to bring together uh, government leaders alongside uh, leaders in technology and industry uh, to talk about the future of work and the future of society. And during that event, the keynote, Elon Musk, who is the uh, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, uh, got on stage and said, there will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. And if my assessment is correct, then we have to think about what we're going to do about it. I think some kind of universal basic income is going to be necessary. The output of goods and services will be extremely high. With automation, there will come abundance. Almost everything will get very cheap, and I think we're going to end up doing universal basic income. It's going to be necessary. Other scholars, entrepreneurs, business leaders, politicians throughout history, but especially 
in the latest sort of rise of artificial intelligence and automation have concluded that some form of universal basic income may be necessary as the economy makes a transition from the one we know today to one that is much more heavily automated. But economists and researchers are still split on how much the workforce will be impacted and how quickly. Oxford University researchers back in 2013, who were among the first to sound the alarm, estimated that 47% of the U.S. workforce was at risk of being lost to automation. At the same time, the OECD did a study of its 21 member countries and suggested only 9% of jobs would be lost to automation. A recent study by PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, predicted that 38% of the American workforce would be displaced in the next 15 years as a result of automation. Another recent study by McKinsey Global Institute said that while automation will replace about 50% of the average worker's daily tasks, only 5% of jobs can be fully automated out of existence. And there are plenty of other reputable organizations who have predictions that fall somewhere in between. Now, these predictions are based on assumptions about the pace of technological advancement, economic factors, and what new regulations are implemented as automation takes a bigger part of the economy, but all suggest that we're on the cusp of some kind of significant transition in the workforce as we know it. As a result, many of the world's most respected technologists and thinkers, including Mr. Musk, as well as Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and Stephen Hawking, see the implementation of a universal basic income not as a question of if, but when. They believe that the only way to avoid mass poverty and civil unrest in the age of automation is to provide every citizen with a small sum each month, no strings attached. But the concept is that when no, safe job, no jobs are safe from automation, everyone will need some sort of safety net. As a result, most proposals for universal basic income seek to provide every citizen with a modest monthly sum, enough to cover the basics, but not enough to discourage work altogether. But where this money will come from, what effects it will have on society, if it's absolutely necessary, and whether it will truly ease the transition that we're about to see into the age of automation still remains unclear. There's some small-scale pilot programs currently taking place in Nambia, Uganda, India, Brazil, Finland, the Netherlands, Alaska, Oakland, and in my home province of Ontario that are hoping to provide some answers, but the true impact of universal basic income can't really be understood until a long-term, truly universal study is completed. Now, to debate whether or not such an experiment should be pursued in the United States, we welcome two esteemed political scientists, each with profiles and accomplishments that could probably take the entire hour to list in full. So I'm going to try and keep it short while still doing their accomplishments justice. Uh, the motion for this debate is a universal basic income is necessary in the age of automation. Representing the pro side, we have author, political scientist, and libertarian scholar Charles Murray. Dr. Murray is the W.H. Brady Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and the author of numerous books, including Losing Ground, The Bell Curve, Coming Apart, and By the People. Mr. Murray has a PhD in political science from MIT. His opponent, representing the con side, is author, economist, and political scientist Jared Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, served as pres Vice President Joe Biden's chief economist and economic advisor, and was executive director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class, as well as a member of President Obama's economic team. Mr. Bernstein holds a PhD in welfare from Columbia University. Gentlemen, thank you very much once again for being here. Um, and once again, the motion for the debate is a universal basic income is necessary in the age of automation. At this point in time, I'm going to ask the audience to vote on where you stand on this issue currently. We're going to conduct another poll at the end of the debate, and the winner will not be chosen based on how many votes they get in the, in the poll exactly, but the change in their votes over the hour. So whoever sees the greatest increase in their score over the next hour will ultimately be the winner, not who comes up with the best nickname. Um, I believe the instructions are right above, so please take a moment to uh, put in your you guys don't get a vote, by the way. Just, um, <laughs> but the rest of you, please put in your votes now. Should be voting once now and then again after. Yeah. Okay. We getting it? Yeah. Yes. All right. We got a thumbs up from somebody with gray hair, so I think we're okay. <laughs> um, all right. So. I guess uh, you guys can keep doing that, but I'm going to start. 
I hope you don't mind. Uh, we'll now begin the formal debate program. And just to sort of outline the format here, uh, our debaters will both present their opening statements of seven minutes each, and then they'll get uh, two rounds of rebuttal of four minutes apiece. I will then lead a 15-minute moderated discussion before opening up to questions from all of you. So please have a few questions ready. Uh, when it comes time for the Q&A, uh, if you do have a question, please wait until I call on you and someone will bring over a microphone and just state your name before you start talking. And of course, please make sure it is in the form of a question. Um, all right, so to get started, uh, I invite Dr. Charles Murray up to the podium to present his opening statement. Oh, sorry. It's so nice to be in front of an audience that is not rushing the podium. Uh, <laughs> this is a debate about the future, or at least it better be, because otherwise I don't have a prayer. I am going to present a clean, principled plan that would work if it were put into effect as I prescribe. It is affordable today, and it will be vastly cheaper than the current system a decade hence. But the idea that Congress can pass any clean principled bill does not pass the laugh test. So if my friend Jared Bernstein says that this is a libertarian pipe dream that will never get implemented, you will see me nodding in agreement. But here's what I see as my contribution to tonight's debate. To pose for you some propositions about how the world could work, just as Jared's contribution is to pose his vision of how the world should work, both of us knowing that these are visions that cannot be passed today. But if we don't do that, if we don't talk in terms of this is the course we ought to be taking in broad terms, we're never going to accomplish anything but tinker at the margins. Both of us need, I think, to, uh, however, even though we know it's not politically practicable, I've got, I've got to present the fact that it's economically practicable, that it could work if it were passed, and, and I'm prepared to do that. But I also need to give you the specifics of the plan that I have in mind, because the uh, basic, uh, universal basic income could be a disaster if it were implemented under certain kinds of conditions. And the plan I'm proposing is specifically designed to try to avoid those disasters. I haven't been able to figure out a way to present the plan without eating up the whole seven minutes, so I will have to wait until uh, my next round before I start to talk about automation. The universal basic income, UBI, that I propose would require a constitutional amendment. I'm not competent to put it in legal language, but I can tell you the sense of it. Henceforth, federal, state, and local governments shall make no law nor establish any program that provides benefits to some citizens but not to others. All programs currently providing such benefits are to be terminated. The funds formerly allocated to them are to be used instead to provide every citizen with a cash grant beginning at age 21 and continuing until death. The annual value of the cash grant at the program's outset is to be $13,000. Here are the nuts and bolts. Earned income has no effect on the grant until income reaches $30,000. From $30,000 to $60,000, a surtax is levied uh, that reimburses the grant up to a maximum of half. Thus, persons making more than $60,000 get a UBI of $6,500. The grant goes only to citizens. It is electronically deposited into a known bank account monthly. That's an important feature that we may come back to. No bank account, no grant. Definition of earned income is based on individuals regardless of marital status or living arrangements. Thus, a wife, for example, who makes less than $30,000 will get the full $13,000 no matter how much her husband makes. Why? You know, why should somebody making $100,000 a year get to keep any of it? It's because in getting rid of all transfer programs, I'm getting rid of Social Security. I'm getting rid of Medicare, as well as Medicaid and all so social services programs, all welfare programs, and for that matter, all agricultural subsidies and all corporate welfare. In 2014, the amount spent on those programs was $2.77 trillion. The cost of the UBI that year uh, would have been $212 billion less than that. As of 20. 22, 2023, we're talking about it being a trillion dollars cheaper than the increased cost of the current system. Uh, 
The only restriction on the use of the UBI is that uh, $3,000 must be used to buy a catastrophic and long-term health care insurance policy. Uh, I, I'm prepared to defend that as being reasonable. If Jared wants to argue about it, I'm going to pass it up right now because I'd like to focus on the uh, $10,000 of disposable income that's left. Here is a dynamic I think is most important. It's not that an individual gets $10,000 a year disposable income. What's important is that everybody knows that everybody else is getting that $10,000 and will indefinitely. The first thing, good thing that happens from that is a carrot. $10,000 a year isn't much, but if you team up with another person, uh, marriage is the obvious way, but it can also mean having a roommate, you have $20,000. Suppose you work at a really low paying job, I mean minimum wage, and you don't even work the whole year, and let's say you clear $12,000 a year, and so does your partner. You're looking at a total of $44,000 at that point of disposable income. That's an income that lets the two of you live a decent existence way above the poverty line. And you're not looking over your shoulder at the welfare office's eligibility rules, or the disability insurance program's restrictions on work, you're not getting your resources in dribs and drabs, some welfare income, a housing subsidy, food stamps, a tax credit, a city-specific program that you're going to lose if you try to go to places that have a better economy. You're getting money, cash, no strings attached, no pleading with the social worker. You have assets that you can control and use as you see fit. The next good thing is a stick. Having an income stream gives a person moral agency whether he wants it or not. Maybe a guy is living off his girlfriend and not helping with the rent, or he's constantly catching money from his friends, or he's so stoned that he can't hold a job. Now he can claim helplessness. There's nothing he can do about it. He has a hundred excuses. Under the UBI, all those excuses coexist with a brand new fact. Everybody knows that he has $833 in disposable income hitting his bank account in a few days. And until then, he needs to get a little help from his friends, or siblings, or parent, or girlfriend, or the Salvation Army. People can tell him, we aren't going to let you starve to death, but it's time to get your act together, in a way they can't now. Imagine those kinds of interactions taking place millions of times a day all over the country, and going on for months and years. The carrot. If you can attract just one other person to be a partner, you have an easy route to a secure income. The stick, you can be held responsible for an actions in the way you can't now. I'm sure Jared and I will be arguing about the downsides that a UBI might bring, but realize at the outset its potential for a huge upside, revitalizing American civil society. Thank you. Before I start my seven minutes, I wanted to just express uh, how happy I am to be here. I love these kinds of events. Uh, we don't do enough of them. Uh, getting a bunch of people together in such a beautiful place, I don't know that I've been in a, a room as nice as this. Uh, there's some um, offices, uh, some, some rooms in Congress that look a little bit like this, but they've got Congress people in them, so it's... <laughs> it's not quite as nice. And uh, I wanted to just be sure, before I start, uh, uh, say uh, what a, a pleasure it is to be here in Dallas. Uh, Jane, thank you for helping me get down here. You know, I got to the airport to uh, Love Field. I get off the plane and they offered me a cupcake. <laughs> Do you know why? See, I, I may know Dallas history better than people in this room. Uh, it's the 100-year anniversary of Love Field. So I'm sure we plan Harlan planned the event to coincide with that. So. Well, well done, and thank you, Harlan, and, and David, thank you, and uh, Adam Smith uh, for capitalism. Um, <laughs> and it's always uh, an honor to be here with Charles. Uh, I was saying, I don't, I don't you know, we're going to disagree. <laughs> and uh, while some of Charles' scholarship I found problematic, I was telling him before we started, I wish everyone had read his book, Coming Apart, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. I'm not saying we wouldn't have been in the mess we're in, but uh, we would have understood why we're in this mess. Okay, I'm gonna press start, well, if you can start my timer. Um, 
I'm opposed to the motion that a UBI is necessary in the age of automation because the UBI is the wrong solution for the wrong problem. Now let me explain. Charles is suggesting, as you just heard, a set of big ambitious changes, changes that I'll try to show you are likely to hurt far more people than they'll help. One of my biggest problems with his plan, and he was very clear about this, is that he takes resources from people who need them and gives them to people who don't. That's the universal part of the UBI, the U, and I view it as uh, highly wasteful. To be crystal clear, I believe, as does Charles, that there are people who need some help, and in some cases, they need that help due to the impact of automation. But we have to be much better shepherds of our public resources than his plan allows. There are a lot of affluent people who simply don't need the help that Charles proposes to give them. Ending Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Earned Income Credit, Nutritional Support, Housing Assistance, Student Aid, programs that all tilt their support to people who need it most, and instead sending a per capita check would be a massively disruptive thing to do. Now, that doesn't make it a bad idea. As I've suggested, I think the policy is constructed in such a way that it disqualifies it. But it does mean that if you're going to undertake such a, uh, uh, such a disruptive and, and a change of this magnitude, you need a really strong, rock-solid rationale for making those changes. And that's where my opposition to the other part of the motion comes in, this part about the age of automation. So let's start with a thought experiment. Say it's 1802, you're Thomas Jefferson's chief economist, and you've got a magic fax machine which just spit out a report from the future, from the year 2017, showing that 1% of the workforce is employed in farming, as opposed to 90% in your day. You run into President Jefferson's office with the news of this crisis telling him that we've got to start preparing for mass unemployment, but you would have been wrong. Yes, technology displaced scads of farm workers, but it also created scads of jobs in other sectors. If automation solely destroyed jobs, how did we ever create 130 million net new jobs since 1900? If the robots are kicking our humanoid butt so badly, how is it that the unemployment rate is just slightly north of 4%? And why is productivity, output per labor hour of work, growing more slowly now when the automa automation hypothesis would predict exactly the opposite? So let me tell you how I think this really works. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago called, The Robots Aren't Coming, They're Here, and Some of Them Are Helpful. The idea that automation is killing jobs has been around forever, and the debate we're having now is the same one we've always had. One side says the robots are coming for your jobs, the other side says no, they're not, and nothing much gets resolved. I think this is the wrong way to look at the impact of technology in the workplace. What if, rather than replacing everybody, automation displaced some people, but helped other people be more productive? Now, a few years ago, and Jared mentioned this, a study came out that freaked a lot of people out. It claimed that almost half of all jobs in the US had a high likelihood of being replaced by automation within a decade or two, and that sounds very scary. Except, and uh, Jared mentioned this as well, a deeper dive into those same uh, weeds by researchers from, uh, from the OECD took that number down to 9%, from 47% uh, down to 9%. That 5x decline was driven by the fact that even in jobs where there's been a lot of automation, people still do stuff that requires, you know, other people. For example, a lot of what accountants do, auditors, factory workers, a lot of what they do can be automated, but many such workers must interact with people to do their job. So when I say I oppose the motion because UPI, UBI is proposing to fix something that isn't broken, this is what I mean. There is simply no evidence to support and much evidence to refute the idea that the pace of labor displacing automation has accelerated. And if automation is the wrong problem, UBI is the wrong solution. And here's why. Back in 2007, before the Great Recession whacked the heck out of the US economy, child poverty was 17.5%. Now note that this measure takes account of the list of programs I ticked off above, the one that Charles wants to get rid of to support his UBI. Now fast forward to 2010, when the economy has been really slammed by, by the Great Recession. If you ignore all of our anti-poverty policies, if you got rid of them the way Charles wanted, kids' poverty went up five percentage points. That's a massive increase, an increase of four million poor kids. But once you account for the anti-poverty programs that kicked into place, the child poverty rate actually fell slightly. 
from down to 17.2%, 17.5 to 17.2. We can call it the same, but actually, now let me underscore this point. In the worst recession since the Great Depression, child poverty did not go up at all. How could that be? Because increased nutritional support, housing support, unemployment insurance, wage subsidies, job programs, and more helped families with kids offset the impact of the downturn. Charles' UBI scheme gets rid of all of those programs. Unlike the programs I just mentioned, his UBI program does not scale up uh, with need in recessions. Add those facts to my earlier point that uh, Charles Plan would, by writing checks for everybody, dilute the resources we're currently using to help those in need. And you'll understand why I'm so convinced that this plan will lead to more poverty, especially in recessions and especially for families with kids. I know he argues otherwise and we'll be going back and forth all night, but I, and, and in fact, I wish it were so. But math being what it is, there's simply no way you can take an amount, we'll call X, he was citing some trillions there, you, can, you can't take an amount that we're gonna call X, spread it over literally tens of millions more people that are currently getting X, and not expect that action to dilute the impact of X on the subset of economically vulnerable people who need the most help. You can claim savings from less bureaucracy, but now you're talking about saving millions, when Charles is talking trillions, and his plan has implementation costs as well. The only way to make less advantaged people better off with the UBI is to keep what we have in place and write checks on top of that, and that is a very expensive uh, endeavor involving the raising of much more tax revenue, and thus not something I suspect many people in this room would read readily support. Now, I'll flesh these arguments out over the course of our debate, but my objection to the motion in closing has two simple parts. First, automation kills jobs and creates jobs, and there's no evidence to suggest it's doing now, it's doing so uh, now any differently than it has in the past. Secondly, our anti-poverty programs, though far from perfect, are working well, especially when it comes to offsetting recessions. Charles' UBI plan would lose and undermine that capacity while diluting their impact and making a lot of people worse off. Thank you. Let me take my four minutes to concentrate on the automation problem and then we can come back to some of the, the economic issues that Jared raised subsequently. Uh, I'm arguing that this time is different and that is a very dicey argument to make for precisely the reasons that Jared said as he gave the thought experiment based on 1802. But I am saying this time is different and I, I guess the best example I can give for this has to do with what's a fairly well accepted uh, benchmark within the AI community, the artificial intelligence community, for when we're going to get to the point where computers are going to be having something resembling the intelligence of an ordinary human being. And that benchmark is when you have 10 quadrillion calculations per second on a computer that costs $1,000, which is, doesn't, doesn't mean that computer is going to be as smart as a human, but once we get to that point, the technology as a whole will be at that level. At that point, we have computers that are able to do unimaginable things in terms of automation uh, that we, we can't conceive of now. It's not a curve that goes like this, it's a curve that is gonna go like that. And I can be quite specific in terms of that 10 quadrillion calculations per second figure. Right now, we're only at a thousandth of that number. And you can say, well, if we're only at a thousandth, we're not talking about the revolution barreling down at us. Consider this. In 1985, we were at a trillionth of that number. In 1995, we were at a millionth, I'm uh, sorry, a billionth. In 2005, we were at a millionth, and now we're at a thousandth. You can just plot the line in your head, and we get to 10 quadrillion per second in 2025 based on the line as it has been consistently changing over the last three decades. At that point, it's not truck drivers who aren't gonna have jobs because we have driverless cars. At that point, we're going to be gutting vast numbers of white collar jobs that are worth 70 grand a year right now because the person brings value added in terms of the judgments that the person is making which no longer require people. They can be done by the software more accurately 
for a, a very wide variety of jobs that I can be more specific about subsequently. This is not a few million jobs, this is tens of millions of jobs. And here's the real kicker, and this is something that I want to emphasize. In the past, when technology displaced jobs, the jobs that replaced them were ones that could be done by the people who lost jobs. With the new technology, the, the new jobs that are created, Amazon is just hiring 50,000 people. That's great. They've also automated their warehouses. That's gotten rid of a lot, rid of, a lot of jobs. You know what? The 50,000 jobs they're going to hire for, or for are not jobs that can be done by the people who are doing the warehouse jobs. And here I'm going to raise the dreaded word IQ. Because what is going to be the case coming down the road that you have to be pretty high on the IQ scale to be able to be trainable for the kinds of jobs that have been created because you know what? Those jobs are going to be for people who know how to use the assets of the computer, of the software, to give value added. And as a simple statement of fact, that's a level of cognitive ability that is a relatively small proportion of the population, and we do not know how to jack up IQ. We don't know how to train for that. So I can give lots of specifics later, but if you take nothing else away from tonight's debate, it is this that we are confronting a world not 50 or 60 or 70 years away from us, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years away from us that is utterly unlike any we have encountered before. Thank you. So do you know what one of the most in-demand occupations is, if you look at the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics will tell us uh, the occupations that are going to demand the most workers in the next uh, 10 years. They've had a, a pretty accurate track record even with all this technology. It's home health aides, child care workers, teachers. Now, as I said in my talk, those jobs can be complemented with automation, but they can't be replaced. And I think the thing that uh, you really have to wrap your head around is neither Charles, nor I, nor even Jared uh, know the answer to this question 10 years hence. I don't know it, Charles doesn't know it, I'm sure he'd be the first to admit. The Luddites, the folks who've said that the robots are coming for our jobs, have always been wrong. I suspect they'll be wrong again. But since we don't know what's going, we just have to admit that we don't know. Yes, computers do a lot of calculations, but threshing machines got rid of lots of people's jobs. We simply don't know. So let's look at the present. Certainly there is a lot more automation, a lot more robotics than there's ever been before. All, you heard Charles talk about the improvements in computer power, and I believe me, I know it. I get somewhere I have my, uh, you know, my computer. Uh, an, amazing, uh, an amazing advance, and yet, I mentioned this in my talk, let me get a little deeper into these economic weeds here. If, in fact, machines, robots, AI, automation were replacing workers, the rate of output per hour or productivity would be accelerating. And would it be accelerating quickly? It's the opposite, it's decelerating, it's growing more slowly. So clearly, technology has not found its way into the workforce in reality, such that it's displacing workers uh, at any sort of an accelerated rate. And you can make up stories about, well, we're not measuring this or that, but believe me, we've dug into those weeds and we can't find it. I'm not saying that uh, technology won't disrupt lives and displace workers. It will, it always has. What I am saying is that the clearest evidence, including evidence today, uh, is that that isn't happening now, and that's what we ought to be focused on, because that's what we know, the other thing we don't know. You know, we have a, fe we have a Federal Reserve that's raising interest rates because they think the job market is too hot. Now, we can have good arguments about that, but the unemployment rate is truly low. We are creating, uh, uh, we, we are in the midst of robust job creation. Now, that's why the automation set up for this UBI is, 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 a bad, is, is, is the wrong uh, motivation. It's a bad motivation, but it's the UBI problem that I think uh, I, I would argue most strongly against. I don't know what the future holds. I do know that the UBI has the problem I stressed in my opening remarks, and I'm going to say it again. You know, Charles had his, if you only take one thing from this debate, here's mine. 
A dollar going to someone who doesn't need it is a dollar not going to someone who does. A dollar going to someone, or $13,000, or $2 trillion going to someone who does not need it is a dollar that's not going to someone who does. And that is my fundamental problem with the U part of the UBI. As Charles himself suggested, if you're the spouse of a wealthy person, uh, you get a full UBI uh, check uh, from, uh, from the government. Now, the only way you can do that and not significantly hurt the disadvantaged in our economy, and by the way, let me be very clear, because Charles and I probably have more agreement on this than you might think, uh, we have work to do to improve the functionality of the programs that help poor people. I showed you their countercyclical function was very effective in the last recession. But the only way you can actually help those people and still do the UBI is to do the UBI on top of the current system, which means basically raising twice as much now as we do in taxes. And uh, e even I wouldn't be for that. Thank you. Both Jared and I are in the position of looking at this clock and seeing we have four minutes and saying, I can't get to everything. Okay, uh, some points very rapidly. Look, if you have the Murray family, who are both retirement age, we take home about, combined the two, between the two of us, close to $40,000 a year in Social Security. Under the UBI plan, the Murrays would take home $13,000, okay? I think that's a transfer from people who have money to people who don't. And, and that is true for, look, I'm taking, I am taking those people with money, I'm saying I'm taking away your Social Security, I'm taking away your Medicare, you're going to get $6,500 in cash starting at 21, which actually wouldn't bother me at all. I can use that $6,500 a whole lot better than the government can in planning for my retirement. I'm making a simpler point. The UBI I propose is a massive transfer of money from the haves to the have-nots. I'll tell you what it doesn't do. It does not do what Jared wants to do, which is to say, well, let's have a child nutrition program and, and have money and we're going to try to find all the kids who have child nutrition needs and give them that money. I'm going to put money in people's pockets to buy food for their own kids. And that goes to a much broader worldview where I'm going to characterize it unfairly, Jared, and you can fix it, okay? <laughs> uh, it's, it's as if you're, t it's a kind of serfdom if you're poor today. You're living in a particular place, you've gotten on a bunch of different programs. Oftentimes, it's really hard to do it. A lot of times, you have poor people who don't get on those programs because the application process is so onerous, and you get dribs and drabs, and don't, don't, don't do anything to improve your life because if you do, you're going to lose some of those benefits. This is particularly evil with the uh, disability insurance program where essentially you sell your, your life as of dignity in return for a lifetime disability payment, but you can't get a job. <sighs> The social welfare state, as far as I'm concerned, is, is most destructive insofar as it takes people and it makes it as difficult as possible for them to make their own decisions about what they ought to spend their money on, what their kids need most, how they can help them the most. And, and another thing it does is it severs all the incentives that is going to draw people together to form families, to form communities, to form cooperative relationships, whereby we, we are creating communities that deal with human needs at the best possible level, which is the lowest possible level. And the reason to do this is not to save money. The reason to do this is not because of evil bureaucrats. It is because human needs inherently cannot be dealt with through bureaucratic rules. They are best dealt with by the people closest to the people with problems. And what I am doing with low-income communities is pouring a massive amount of money into them. With regard to the, very briefly, the automation issues uh, that were brought up, I'm not talking about what's going on today. I'm not talking about a trend line that should already, already be moving up in terms of jobs being displaced. I am talking about capabilities that are on a nonlinear curve. And right now, those capabilities are not replacing a whole bunch of jobs. I'm saying it's the increased capabilities 
vastly nonlinearly increased capabilities that are going to produce a situation whereby we have millions of people, people who are bright people with energy and so forth who can't find a full-time job, which leads to my teaser for the next part which is that there is lots of work to be done, as Jared alluded to, in, in social capital. And you know what? A lot of people are doing that and having lives of dignity and worth and satisfaction today. They're called homemakers. Most of them are women. That's a topic I hope we get to later in the discussion. You know, I, I always find it very odd that I... Uh, argue with conservatives about this, but when you start writing people checks for $12,000 for nothing, you're not getting rid of the social welfare state. Uh, in fact, you're transferring uh, the social welfare state, which has a set of conditions, and we can argue about whether those conditions and eligibility criteria are, are, are legitimate or good or useful, and you're just saying, uh, Never mind, here's 12,000 bucks, sorry, 13. <laughs> here's 13,000 uh, bucks know, for existing. Um, and by the way, nobody gets lifted out of serfdom for $13,000 a year, not even for $26,000 a year if they can get married, especially when they have to take 6,000 off the top and buy catastrophic health insurance, and especially if they take that 6,000 off the top, uh, buy catastrophic health insurance, and now they have a $20,000 income and they've bought this health insurance and they get sick. Remember, catastrophic insurance is the type with very high deductibles and co-pays. So while you can disparage all day, Charles, this set of programs uh, that you don't like because of their bureaucratic complexity, the point is, the fact is that those programs have actually been effective in accomplishing their goals. Now, they need to be more effective, but we can talk about how to do that. But um, one of my key points here, and these, these, are, these are data, so this is not, this is not a, a story, uh, is that child poverty in the worst recession since the Great Depression didn't go up, it went down slightly. So the idea that you would take all of that away and give a, a, a chunk of it to, uh, to people who are in the upper reaches of the income scale uh, remains a fundamental uh, flaw of this plan. Now you mentioned Social Security. Social Security is actually a very interesting and good example of your case because it is a universal program. And I need to be careful not to say I'm against every universal program. The thing about Social Security, it is a very progressive universal program. It, uh, uh, the uh, folks at the lower end of the scale get a lot more out of Social Security uh, than they put into it, and I think that that is, uh, it, that is appropriate. Now let me say a couple of words about, uh, again, about, about the automation thing. Again, I, I must stress that we really don't know what's going to happen 10 years down the road, and nothing you've said about computer power convinces me that, uh, you know, that that insight sheds any light on what the future of work will look like uh, relative to uh, today. But what I can tell you from what we've seen in, in the history of technology as it's worked its way into the workforce, I'm gonna introduce a couple of terms from microeconomics here, uh, so sorry. Uh, I, I didn't like microeconomics either. Um, uh, substitutes and complements. The key to technology and work is whether you are a substitute to technology or a complement to technology. If you're complementary, then technology helps you. And to be clear, it's not just high-end lawyers and analysts that are complementary to technology. There was a great piece the other day in the Wall Street Journal about warehouse workers who work with robots. This was my point when I said the robots are here and some of them are helpful. And the robot helped this person be much more productive in throughput, which if you know anything about retail or Amazon, it's all about throughput. So complementarity is key. Now, substitutability means the technology can displace you. And that's real. It exists. It's happened forever. And the key there is not to write somebody a check for 13,000 bucks, the key there is to make sure people have jobs. And here, I have 15 seconds, and I'm gonna land, land I'm gonna try to, what do they say, spike the landing uh, in, in, in gymnastics? I wouldn't guarantee an income, I'd guarantee a job. Thank you. Thank you.
for that gymnastics move. Um, very much appreciated. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, 15 minutes of questions uh, for both of you. Um, I guess we should start with uh, Dr. Bernstein, since Dr. Murray got the first statement. I'll give you the uh, first question. Um, so on my left, I have a political scientist who says that automation will displace jobs. On my right, I have a political scientist who says automation won't displace jobs. But the people who are really ringing the alarm bells here are the people who are at the core of the technology industry. We're talking about the people who are building the technology that they believe will ultimately displace jobs. Does it not require extra consideration when the people who are actually working on this technology and perhaps have the best view of the future output of technology are the ones saying that it's necessary? So let me be very, very, very clear. I am not saying, as you suggested, I said, I am not saying automation does not displace jobs. I want to be very clear. Automation does displace some jobs. It always has. It but, always will. But they're the ones pushing UBI specifically as... I understand. Yeah. I'll get to yeah. your question. Okay. It's a very good question. Um, and I want to try to be nice to my friends in Silicon Valley, although it's not always easy <laughs> for me. Um, uh, but I do, I do want to be clear. I'm not denying that uh, there's displacement. It's just that automation also creates, uh, in fact, many more opportunities than it is destroyed. That's what history shows. Those folks are more out of touch than you might think. Um, they write algorithms, and you know, some of these algorithms help you get a pizza more quickly, and that's great. You know, some of them are extremely useful. I use Waze, W-A-Z-E, all the time. I love it. These are you know, a, a amazing algorithms with, with tremendous value added. Um, and yet, they've not been shown to displace employment. And that's the case that I've been trying to make throughout my uh, remarks today, nor have they been shown to increase output per labor hour. They haven't increased the economy's output. Part of that is because a lot of them are just kind of silly diversions. But they have this idea that because they can write algorithms that make something happen differently, that the world of work is completely changed. And you know, I don't want to insult anybody in the audience, but there's some, my experience in this field over decades, Charles, you might agree with this, is that sometimes people get rich and they think they know stuff, and um, you know, sometimes Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. All right, then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dr. Murray, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to Dr. Bernstein's point in his uh, last statement here, He's saying that we're not getting rid of the welfare state by implementing UBI. And one of the appeals of the welfare program is that taxpayers know where the money is going to. They know that people who need food are getting food stamps, mm -hmm. people who need housing are getting housing subsidies, giving a check to everybody, uh, even people who are potentially not going to spend it on things that they desperately need could be dangerous. Um, how do you feel about that? This is just such a different in wor difference in worldview. Mm. My, my, my opinion of the efficiency of the system and getting the money to the people who need it is very dim, but that's something I can't prove right now. But I can say what I f feel very strongly about, which is I like to assume that other people are moral agents as well, and I want to give them resources where their lives can be in their hands. And right now, they are not in their hands. If you are caught in poverty in this country and you are on a variety of programs, you, are, you, you aren't getting resources that you can do anything with. You can't save up by uh, making cuts here because you have a, a, a pot of cash that you can disperse as you see fit. There's no way to save up because you get the food stamps and you better use the food stamps for food stamps. You get the housing subsidy, but that has to go to housing. You get uh, welfare, which can be a, is in the form of a check, but don't move away because you have to establish, reestablish your eligibility. That's what I meant by serfdom. And, and I think that the UBI does something exceptionally important, especially with regard to the American tradition. It assumes of our fellow citizens that they should be free to live their lives as they see fit, and that includes being given assets that they can deploy as they see fit. Will anybody misuse those? They sure will. But I think one of the most important statements I made is that under the system I'm proposing, we will once again have American civil society that has a chance to work, which is you don't straighten out somebody at long distance. You straighten out somebody because you know whether this particular person in this particular circumstances needs a pat in the back or a kick in the pants. 
and you have the people closest to that person who can hold their feet into the fire if that's necessary, who can provide them with additional support if that's necessary. It's not just that this is a better way of dealing with human needs. This is a much better way. It is the American way for communities to run. So let me respond to that, if I might. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna, there's a point of agreement here that uh, I'd, I'd like to, to get into. But first, I want to talk about fungibility. So when I started my career, I actually worked as a social worker in New York City. This is like 100 years ago. And uh, I got to tell you, your, your, your idea that somehow cash is better than something else, uh, say food stamps, um, is pretty misguided in the following sense. For poor people, food stamps are money completely fungible. A dollar of food stamps is worth close to a dollar of dollar <laughs> uh, to low-income people uh, because they're so liquidity constrained that uh, that trade-off is just automatic. That said, where we might have uh, a bit of agreement is there is an idea that says let's take what we give to the poor not a UBI, which squanders resources on people who don't need it, but let's take what we give to the poor and just write them a check. And let their own sovereignty drive what they do. And, you know, and their I, neighbors, I, their own sovereignty and their neighbors. Yeah, I, I could, you know, I, I, that's an argument I think we could have. But, it, it, you know, remember, a dollar given to someone who doesn't need it is a dollar you don't get to the folks who do. And then I'll, one more thing and then I'll stop. So, the Ameri you keep talking about the American tradition. And it, it, I don't see writing checks for everybody as part of the American tradition. I just don't see it. It's not my understanding of the American tradition, especially writing checks to people you know, in the very upper reaches of the income scale. I do think that there is an American tradition uh, uh, that if you're able-bodied, you ought to be able to work. Not because the state says you have to, but because that's how I believe most people really derive uh, their, uh, many people really derive their, their sense of self-worth. And I, I've seen that firsthand. And so if there is, there's a, there's a lot to do in this country. And if there isn't enough gainful employment, and there are pockets of, of, of geographies where that's the case, I would help people get to work through training and through subsidized employment. I would guarantee a job. I wouldn't guarantee an income. Um, all right. And uh, Dr. Mayer, I want to give you a chance to directly respond to this idea of squandering resources, because one of the accusations that Dr. Bernstein is saying about your plan is that you're putting money into the pockets of people who don't necessarily need it. The millionaires and billionaires are still getting a check at the end of the month. And as he says, that's a dollar not going to the poor. How do you defend that position? Uh, I guess I want to repeat what I said in the second four minutes. Now, the Murrays are not rich, but we're, you know, in the upper end of it. And I'm talking about a program that instead of giving the Murrays uh, $40,000 a year is going to give them $13,000 a year. That's actually more than that because I'm also giving up Medicaid, uh, Medicare. And I'm saying, and I guess I've I would like you to respond directly to sure, this. Sure, I will. For vast numbers of people with, with more than sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year, this is a massive transfer away from them to people with less money. Massive. Okay, so there are definitely winners and losers under this program. And I've, if you read Charles' appendix, I think, uh, he goes through some of the examples. And uh, I do think that there are families at the... Uh, to the extent that the uh, Social Security example applies to high-end families, uh, I do think that that kind of uh, transfer is, is, is a realistic assessment of the impact of the UBI. And there are ideas that would lower the benefits of Social Security to high-income people and raise them for low-income people. And I think that's uh, an idea worth discussing. But that's simply redistribution within the Social Security system. Uh, I, I, I guarantee you, Charles, that there are losers under your plan. And, and they come in two forms. One, families that have a lot of kids are going to lose uh, because many of our programs uh, are keyed, EITC, are keyed to the number of children. And secondly, I, I tricked some of the numbers out myself. You look at a middle income family, when they lose their Social Security and when they lose their Medicare, that's really hard times. And I think that is a real flaw in your, in your plan okay. and one we haven't talked enough about. Got to respond to that. Yeah. How many of you out there at age 21 would have said you can either be in the social security system paying the payroll taxes you're paying or you can have sixty five hundred dollars a year uh and let's say that you only have 35 because let's say the three has gone three of that has gone to uh, uh to medical care Thir you have thirty five hundred dollars a year starting at age 21 that you can use to invest on your own for your own retirement how many people in this room would choose the current social security system over 
$3,500 a year starting at 21 going until 65. And all of you in this room who deal in investments and deal in the uh, uh, returns in a nanosecond would say, give me the 3,500 bucks uh, because I will accumulate by 65 a pile way bigger than the social security system. So you have in a lot of ways the best of both worlds. Uh, you can say to people who are going to be making lots of money, you're going to get way less, technically speaking, 55 years out uh, than you are uh, uh, under the old system. But you also give these people away and say, yeah, who cares? I'm going to be better off with this lesser amount of money I'm getting. So if you want to propose a plan wherein we provide low-income people with some capital that they can invest, you know, I'd be interested in talking about it. That's not the UBI. The UBI gets rid of Social Security. Now, you can disparage Social Security uh, relative to stock market returns, but I remember I was there, I don't know if you were as well, when uh, we were engaged in the privatization debate in uh, G.W. Bush's uh, second term, uh, and the stock market tanked, and that was the end of that debate. Um, Social, and, and, and it was the end of that debate for a good reason. You can't time the market if you're saving for retirement. And as Charles' example is a good one, but there's also the example of people in, in later stages of, of their life uh, who would not take that trade. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and in fact, uh, Social Security is the only guaranteed pension uh, that the federal government provides, and in fact, one that most employers don't even provide anymore. Everything is now defined contribution. It is a DB plan, a defined benefit plan, vested for everyone, and in that sense, it, there's a reason why it's so beloved. Last point on this. Same thing with Medicare, same thing with food stamps, same thing with Social Security. Charles was talking about you know, the, the waste. Every one of these programs spends something between two and 5% of its benefits on administration. You know, I mean, I bet, I bet Harlan would, 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 uh, would crave a margin like that in any private sector business. So these are, these are efficient programs that do what they're supposed to do. They're not perfect, but to get rid of them so you could write people a, a check for 13,000, 3,000 of which they'd have to replace their Medicare with a catastrophic plan, believe me, nobody's gonna like that deal. All right, we're running out of time here. I just want to get one last question in that I'm going to ask for uh, both of you for your response on. Um, I want you to tell me if, if the thing about disruption is by its very nature, it happens out of the blue, it happens unannounced, and when it happens, it is disruptive, naturally. <laughs> um, you know, we don't know what the next cab driver or, you know, truck driver, there's a lot of indications of, of where the technology is going to disrupt next, but we don't always know for sure. If you're in one of those industries that overnight is losing lots of jobs, if you're a cab driver the day Uber's invented, would you rather have universal basic income or the current social safety net? Which way would you be better off, in your opinion? <laughs> well, aren't we both going to answer? <laughs> well, <laughs> defend, the defend the position. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about having, it's not a safety net so much as a platform uh, from which we can deal with this kind of disruption. Remember what I said at the end of my last statement about uh, uh, we have millions of people who don't have nine to five jobs that are living satisfying lives because of the dignity of the work they do. And I said it's homemakers. Well, historically it has been uh, homemakers who have been spending hours and hours per week creating social capital both in formal ways and informal ways, and it has been a critical resource, and it has been a diminishing resource over the last uh, several decades, as Robert Putnam has doc documented. We need lots of people to be spending lots of time on that. It's not regular work. It's not paid work now. It won't be paid work in the future, but we need it done really badly. And the universal basic income makes it a whole lot easier, not just for women, but for men, to be deeply engaged in the lives of their communities, even though they're getting not that much paid money for it, but they can still put together a decent living for themselves, and they can have the dignity of work. So with, with, with Jared's challenge, and I will shut up and let Jared give his response about guarantee a job, yeah, in a way I am. I am saying that at a time when the old-fashioned job where, where the employer pays you for 40 hours a week, at a time when that's going to be changing radically, there's lots of work to be done, and guess what? You're getting paid for it in, in, a, in a modest sense, but facilitating the recreation, the revitalization of civil society. 
So just where Charles ended, that just really confused me because the UBI is not a paycheck. You get it whether you work or not. So I, I, I don't really understand. Look, I think you asked a very good question. And I think uh, if you were to uh, consider UBI an answer for that, uh, here's why you'd be misguided. I think there is an answer for that. So if this disruption came in an, an industry all of a sudden, it isn't really the way it works, but if it, just for a thought experiment, <laughs> if an industry you know, really took a hit, you're not going to help those people who were hit by that technology shock get back on track by giving them 13,000 bucks, 3,000 of which they have to pay, uh, they have to spend on a catastrophic health plan. The way you're going, and, and by the way, you're especially, imagine somebody in that industry who happens to be working there and has a parent who's a millionaire. Um, there's no reason for you to give that person a penny because their family can help them. Uh, but for someone who is of, say, below the median income and gets displaced from that industry, they don't need a check for $13,000 with nothing attached to it, they actually need help finding their way into, a, into a, a growing industry. And my whole point throughout this automation part of the, the, the discussion is while uh, automation is, is, is whacking jobs in this industry, it's creating jobs in that industry. So we're going to have to help that person with some training, with some education, with some skill building. I like these apprenticeship programs that are showing up. And, and that actually costs some resources. And if we squander our resources by giving a UBI to uh, 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 the kid of a millionaire who just lost their job, we're not going to have them for what we need them for. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So uh, we'll start back there. Just wait for the uh, microphone and uh, go ahead. And please uh, state your name before asking the question. I'm Chris Wolf. I had a question about costs. We've been talking about universal benefits, but unless it's, uh, I guess, a, maybe a flat tax, that would be a universal benefit, maybe. I don't know. But. Um, I mean, we've been talking about that the rich would still be getting, instead of getting $13,000, uh, instead of giving $40,000, they'd be getting $13,000, but they're paying a lot more in uh, than they would be getting out in the $13,000. And so I want to just ask a question about fairness of all this, that the rich would be paying all this in, they're only getting $13,000 out. It seems like this is focusing on need to try and take care of need, but um, you said, uh, uh, Mr. Bernstein, that uh, it doesn't seem right to have people who are just existing get 13,000 just for existing, but they're probably paying in a whole lot more than 13,000. Uh, was there one that you were directing that to? Or probably Mr. Bernstein. Okay. The idea that Charles has is we're, taking all the programs that we currently have, consolidating them, and writing checks to everybody. So I don't know that you're proposing to change the tax structure at all. I, I'm not. No. Yeah, so you're not. So I'm not sure I totally wrap my head around your question. If you're saying that it's unfair for somebody to you know, get, less, uh, get less out in benefits than they pay in in taxes, uh, then you, know, you have kind of a problem with uh, progressive taxation, which is something we've had since we've had taxation. So that's kind of a different conversation. Um, but uh, I don't think either of us is calling for a radical shift to a kind of flat or regressive tax plan. So the problem that you identified would be, uh, what you view as a problem, I don't. The problem that, that you identified would be in the current system and in whatever system either of us have envisioned coming next. Right? Yeah. And I I don't think the question was addressed to me. <laughs> All right. Well, we can continue on then. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, we got a few. Uh, right over here, please. Oh. Unless there's one. Sorry, ready to go. We'll uh, be next. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Greg Andrew, and so my question is for Dr. Bernstein. So I thought one of Dr. Murray's most powerful arguments was the idea that as you, if you're in the current system, as you get a job, you start to phase out of your benefits. And so People who are currently um, on benefits make that marginal benefit to get back to microeconomics question of, hey, I'm going to take a job for $35,000, but I'm going to lose $28,000 in benefits. And so it's better for me to just continue to exist because I'm really going to work 40 hours a week to only get that marginal benefit. Yeah. And so how do you kind of counter sure. that argument? Good question. 
Um, I don't know if Charles' view has changed on this. Um, you remember we were debating this and Robert Rector, who's a, uh, uh, a renowned conservative uh, scholar, uh, stood up and supported me on this question. I don't know if that's changed your view, uh, but um, you, should, you should speak to this as well, so maybe we can both have a stab at this. Um, so the idea that low-income people respond to high marginal tax rates on benefit phase-outs or cliff effects uh, is just almost nowhere to be found in the data. Uh, I take your point regarding the incentives. This is one of the reasons why I don't like microeconomics, because um, it doesn't seem to play out in the real world very much. Um, first of all, you're always better off if you're working. You're just some, you're, you're, you're one minus your marginal tax rate better off, so you're, you may not be a dollar better off, but you're always better off. And so, you know, in microeconomics, there's a disincentive there. We simply don't see it in, in play. Uh, if you look at the majority of able-bodied people on food stamps, on Medicaid, you know, they're working, and not because, uh, not always just because they want to, but because they have to. The safety net simply doesn't support them any more than a UBI would, uh, would suitably support them. So while I am a big advocate of smoothing out those cliffs and having longer phase-outs rates to dampen the impact that you're talking about, it's one that just doesn't really show up in real life very much. Uh, and one of the virtues of my system is that uh, I lure people into working until they can't afford to quit. So under the system I'm proposing, you're making $30,000 plus you're getting your 10K of uh, disposable income, so that's a $40,000 lifestyle, and you make $31,000 a year. Well, you're starting to pay back you know, a couple of hundred dollars uh, from the grant, but your net uh, income is going to be close to 41,000, and nobody's going to quit with a 40, <laughs> a quit a job uh, for paying a couple of hundred dollars back when they've got that kind of earned income. I think that's one of the major advantages. I guess the only thing I'd want to add to that is that, remember, we have this thing in place, which was, uh, by the way, Ronald Reagan's favorite anti-poverty program, and he said this many times, the earned income tax credit, which works much the way you just described, except for it phases out at you know, upper middle, uh, uh, it, phase, it phases out at, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of income. And this is a, uh, an earning subsidy that can amount to four or 5000 bucks for a family. And it's pro-work, it's anti-poverty, it gets the job done without wasting resources at the high end. Last comment on this. My problem with the welfare state is not we're paying too much money to bureaucrats. I never even mentioned the administrative costs of the programs. My problem is, and Jared, you're as aware of this as I am, the efficiency of getting those benefits out there to people is not that high. You have all sorts of people that are not enrolled in programs that by any standard need to be enrolled in them. Oh. And you have a fair number that are enrolled in the programs that arguably don't belong. Well, how do you so, feel about the EITC? Be, let's be specific. No, I'm, I'm responding to something you specifically said there. To, for the current system, yeah. the EITC I'm in favor of. Would it, my system be better? Way better. All right, we'll take the next question. Over here. Hello, uh, to Dr. Murray. I was thinking about the potential follow-on effects, not the immediate, but perhaps the unintended consequences. So do you think there's a possibility that it could make it worse um, People who engage in predatory behaviors against the poor, perhaps you know, raising their rent to exorbitant levels or talking them into ex extreme in interest rates on payday loans because they know every month you're getting $833 deposited. I have a higher opinion of poor people than that. I mean, come on, do, do, do people get conned into doing things? Yes, they do at all income levels and so forth. But the, the, the idea that we can't give cash to people because, well, some people will spe uh, spend it on things that I don't think they should spend it on is to me the epitome of a condescending, these people need our help in the living their lives attitude, which I despise. And I will repeat again, I think the appropriate way to look at people is that they deserve to use assets to live their lives as they see fit. And if they use those assets in ways that I don't approve of, so be it. I'm using my assets in ways they may not approve of. So I actually agree with a lot of that, although the questioner was asking more about people exploiting poor people so more than yeah, poor people. Yeah, I'm saying they're not as exploitable as... But I guess my question would be, if we both agree on what you just said, why give, why, it does, why give 
all this money to people who don't need it. Why does this have to be universal? Why, why don't you respond to the point that the people with money are going to be giving massive amounts of money away under the program? I am transferring vast billions of dollars of money from people who are at the upper income levels no, to no, people no. at the lower. Yeah, you, you have an example of somebody who's at the top of no, the scales no. getting less social security, but wait, you, you've never been able to push back on this idea of dilution. I mean, it's just mathematically impossible to take this much that's going to this many people and then give it to all these people without somebody no. losing. Uh, now, actually, you can identify some winners. No, no. The total amount of money in benefits that is going to go with people with money is a lot less under the UBI than it is right That's now. Fuzzy because math. what because just finish the sentence. <laughs> Two programs that most egregiously benefit people with money are Medicare and Social Security. And once again, the Murrays are not rich, okay? There is a lot of people in this country just like we are. We are making out like bandits yeah. from Social Security and Medicare as well. That's, that's spending money on rich people, not giving them 6,500 bucks a year. That, that's a key point. That's a key point. So let's argue about that for a second. <laughs> so we spend $900 billion a year on Social Security, including Social Security disability. We spend $1.1 trillion a year on our health care programs. So I'm underscoring Charles' points here. The flaw in the argument, and I haven't had a chance, I say, Another flaw in the argument, I haven't had a chance to uh, drill down on this as, as much as I'd like, is that somehow people are going to be able to afford the kinds of insur health insurance coverage under Charles' plan. There's nothing in his plan that enforces better discipline or better financing ideas or less costs or less waste in the healthcare system. And obviously, for those of you who've been paying attention to the news over the last 10 years or so, you know, the healthcare system needs a lot of work. If you simply give people less money, yes, they will spend less on healthcare, but they will get a ton less healthcare. And if you actually trick out these numbers where you're really hurting people, and maybe even the Murrays, I don't know, where you're really hurting people isn't so much in taking away their Social Security. That hurts middle income people, it doesn't hurt high income people. Where you're really hurting them is when you take away their okay, Medicare. Okay, let's talk about my plan for health <laughs> The Medicare. Um, All right, real quick, because I think we're <laughs> running out of time here. Okay, look, in the, in the book, In Our Hands. I talk about this at length. Uh, I had the advantage when I was writing the original version that I was, a friend of mine was the CEO of Cigna, and uh, so I was able to get them to calculate, what if somebody comes to you at the age of 21 and says, I will give you a constant premium for life starting at 21, how, what could uh, you charge for a, a comprehensive healthcare program, not just catastrophic? And it was a pathetically low number. I can't remember now, it was a couple of thousand dollars. And the reason they could, of course, is the same reason you can buy a lot of life insurance at age 21, even though you are definitely gonna die, uh, because the insurance companies over the years make money off, uh, off, off having that. So that's one thing I go through. And the health care plan, I must say though, since you've raised it, okay, I didn't do it, you raised it, I also think it's essential that we treat the entire population as a single gene pool. So we distribute the risks of having a gene for Huntington's disease across the population and also make it possible to disentangle health care from employment. Uh, I think you make health care uh, uh, taxable income if it's provided by employers, once again, to create a better market. I would say that the health care system right now is one in which we have so much potential for, for radically lowering costs because the real costs of health care have been falling for the last 30 or 40 years. The only reason they have been going up is because of artificialities in the market. I didn't want to start the argument about yeah, healthcare, no, I, okay? We have many disagreements <laughs> on that point. All right, I, we can do this all day long, but I don't think we're, uh, we've been given the time. Do we have time for one more question or, we got one more? Okay, we got one more. Brent Schiffer, uh, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Murray, thank you for being here. So. I'd like to maybe start with a theme that I see across both of your arguments that we're trying to help people in this country who need help, right? And, and feel free to disagree with me on that. But I'd like to come back to that after stating a couple of metrics. So um, 2016, we had a deficit of, I think, about $700 billion, uh, despite bringing in record tax revenue. Uh, as Dr. Bernstein stated, unemployment is 
maybe not the lowest 4. it's ever 2%. been. 4.2 percent. It's pretty mm-hmm. low. Um, and you know, this week the Dow Jones Industrial top 23,000, and so I think most people would agree that the economy is is good. Um, we're told that every day, <laughs> and <laughs> so I guess my question would be one for Dr. Bernstein. Uh, considering that this is a good year and we're still running deficits, which would presumably increase when we would get to a bad year, which is going to happen. The market is cyclical. And we're trying to help the people that need help in this country. And if we have to pay for that deficit with borrowing or printing of money, which would uh, cause inflation and actually make that dollar that they're getting from whatever benefits, Social Security, et cetera, worth less, how is that helping them? So how do we pay for it? And for Dr. Murray, your plan, while you said saves, I think, a trillion dollars is what you said. Uh, Uh, About five, seven years out it does, yeah. Yeah. So... That's a step in the right direction, but presumably we would still be running deficits, just smaller deficits. And what's to stop, if we started at 13000 you, you talked about a constitutional amendment, what's to stop that cost from increasing by people just voting in politicians that are going to increase that, that payment with UBI to make it maybe $20,000 now? And again, how do we pay for it? Start with Dr. Bernstein. Okay. Um, first of all... Uh, You threw out a lot of uh, interesting and, uh, as far as I can tell, correct numbers. Um, I would would caution you against, when you're talking about the budget deficit, and I am very concerned about it, more so now than I was before this tax debate, um, because uh, the Republicans just passed a budget resolution which says we're going to add 1.5 trillion to the deficit. So these are not... These are not fiscal hawks, my friends. These are fiscal chicken hawks, and that's a very different type of bird. Uh, I don't think you should talk about deficits as hundreds of billions. I mean, it's okay, but it often needs a context and it you know, can sort of sound scary. You know, the budget deficit right now is probably around 3% of GDP. Uh, and that uh, is not necessarily a problematic level. What's problematic, and you, 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 can't, you nailed it uh, uh, perfectly, is that when you're closing in on full employment, your deficit should be going down, not up. And that means we have structural deficits. Now, structural deficits are a very important thing to understand. A structural deficit is a deficit that grows even at full employment. And it means that your tax system and your outlays are out of whack. They're they're inappropriately integrated because you're not taking in uh, ample receipts even when the economy is percolating. Um, This may make you unhappy, uh, um, which is fine with me on this point, Um, (laughs) but when we're in recession, I want a big deficit. In fact, when we're in recession, my question is, is the budget deficit big enough? But when the economy starts humming along, I want that budget deficit to be coming down. And so, if we're going to meet any of the promises that we've made, and I probably would throw UBI in there too if we're gonna make that promises, we're going to have to square that up. And while people might not wanna hear this, it's, it's, it's truth and realism. Uh, we're going to need more revenues going forward, not less. We're go- simply uh, based on our aging population alone, we're gonna need 2.5% more of GDP over the next 10 years. I'm not even talking about climate change and the intensity of the storms and those costs is generating, which seems like this is a fairly timely uh, and, and geographically appropriate place to be worrying about that. I'm not talking about infrastructure or poverty and inequality, simply based on, I'm not talking about geopolitics. You know, we, we can't continually have this misalignment between our needs and our government revenues. And the problem with today's politicians is that they say you can have this and it'll only cost that, and that doesn't work. Uh, the, the point that was most directly relevant to the big question, I think, is uh, what's to prevent uh, the annual amount getting ratcheted up? And I have two quick responses. One is that when you've gotten rid of all the other programs, the size of the uh, UBI is going to be the central domestic policy issue. Uh, and, and so any debate about that and elections that and, and people running for office are going to be taking positions on that, it's going to be scrutinized real closely. But, and this is perhaps a proper way, since this is the last question for me to end, it's not going to cause me to lose any sleep if the grant goes up. I am, I am, uh, I'm looking for a system that enables everybody to have 
the kind of floor that permits them some degrees of freedom, even if they aren't going to get a really high-paying job. And if that goes up from the $13,000, we live in an age when one particular skill set has become enormously rewarding in the labor market. And that one skill set, the intellectual skills that go under the label of IQ, the economy is tailor-made for people like us, and I'm referring to everybody in the room, none of us has earned that skill set. None of us have studied hard and deserve it. We are just purely lucky. And uh, I can be a libertarian and still say that luck of that magnitude is such that I want, I want to see people who got the short end of the stick on that through no fault of their own uh, to have the ability to live a decent life with dignity and pride and the ability to shape their life. And so if they, we end up spending more money on it, uh, that's okay. One final comment. May I point out to everybody in the room, we all know how incredibly polarized the country is. We know about how people will not listen to news shows on the other channel. We know how people don't want their daughter or son marrying something with different political views. And I want to say, as somebody who's way over on one side of the political spectrum, that point number one, Jared is a genuine lefty. I mean, he's not, uh, he's, he, we're, not we're not talking, we, he's, well, he's, he's way over there. Have you noticed, have you noticed we actually kind of like each other? And have you noticed also that we have not softened our disagreement? We have disagreed radically, but neither one of us seems to have decided the other person is evil because of that. <laughs> and I think that that's to be celebrated. That's yeah, definitely no, that, a good example. Uh, yeah. I think that's Yeah, I, I don't know how lefty I am. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Depends on whose scale. A, a, I was once, when I worked for, for, uh, for the White House, um, President Obama once told me that he thought I needed to sharpen my pitchfork a little bit. So. <laughs> uh, but I do, uh, you know, I do very much agree uh, with uh, Charles' comments, and it's one of the reasons I was so happy to uh, come here and to be here tonight so that we could, could have uh, uh, this discourse. And I'm particularly um, moved by the fact that I think both, uh, you know, Charles has a reputation as, uh, you know, being very harsh on programs for poor people, and that is somewhat deserved. But I think we're, <laughs> but I think that we're both trying to figure out how to help people who need help. My emphasis was on um, an idea that I think uh, took some resources and helped people who didn't need help. Um, we've had a robust argument about that. But at the end of the day, uh, I think we're, we're both arguing for a, a better society. And uh, I, I hope we get there uh, before you and I are too old to recognize <laughs> it. Absolutely. Well, it's an honor to sit between you guys and hear you duke it out in such a cordial and spirited manner. So thank you both very much for being here. Thank you. Now, uh, don't forget, once again, we have to That's take right. a tally. Oh. Are we voting? We have to vote again before we get out to see uh, which score changed the most. So once again, you guys know how to do this from the last time. I hope. Get back on the Wi-Fi if you can. Get back onto that app. Uh, as a reminder, you have to uh, delete your previous response in order to enter your new response, but it has already been logged. You can enter the same one again, but please eliminate the one you had before and add in your new answer. The, uh, the final results of the debate. So starting out tonight uh, in that first round, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So in the first round uh, of the voting, the yes side got 16% of the vote, no got 62 and undecided 22%. On the most recent round, we had yes, 23%, no, 51%. 
And in the end, there was a higher change, a 7% change for the yes side, a 5% change for the no side. So ultimately, <laughs> so the con side is the victor. By a very slim margin, we're checking in to see if there was any Russian involvement, but I believe we're going to accept the results.